responsible for everybody else is this Duncan Edwards from Riley Hill. How old would he be then? 13. 13. And Matt came and he's looking for Alex Farrell, the local lad who played for Evan, went to Evan. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm playing. We got talking. I said, well, the best player of that lot is Duncan Edwards. And he says, what's more, he says, he's mentioned it, man. So that started us after Duncan Edwards and eventually signed him. The incomparable Edwards at his age. He was quite amazing in every aspect of, of the game, really. And I said to Jimmy Murphy, I said, you know, I've been trying to find a weakness in this boy, and I just can't find one. And of course, as time went on, so it proved. Because he had this tremendous ability. And, and, and then he, you see, uh, we played him probably as a, a deep blind centre half, or a double centre half, as they call it today. And uh, he played it brilliantly. You, uh, you, you went up in the midfield, you played in the midfield. It was the same thing. If there was an occasion in one of the matches where you, the goals weren't coming, you probably pushed them up in front and scored goals. Duncan Edwards never altered playing the way Duncan Edwards could play. He never got it in his mind that he was, he was the greatest. He just went out to play the game because he loved every minute of it. The Busby Babes won the championship in consecutive seasons, 1955-56 and 1956-57. We were a, a group of young boys, or young men, to put it, who had all got the same common denominator. We loved to play football. And Matt used to say to us, uh, one of his typical team talks was, uh, go out and enjoy yourself. And if the public see that you're enjoying themselves, then they will enjoy themselves as well. And we got the reputation at that time of playing with a smile on our sleeve, whatever that meant. Uh, the, the public really liked it. The man at the helm, Matt Busby, was responsible for that atmosphere. And the atmosphere went right through to every player, you know. To, to hear someone talking about uh, moving because he wasn't satisfied with anything at Old Trafford was unheard of at that particular time. It was a very, very happy club. He'd been an old player, and he'd be bound, he was bound by the old traditions that existed in his days when they never let you see a ball during the week until a Saturday. And Matt was always in favour of us having a ball out as much as, as much as we could. And even when the old groundsman used to come and complain that we were playing on a Friday afternoon uh, while he was trying to get the pitch ready for Saturday, uh, we used, Matt says the groundsman wants to know why you're playing. And we said, would you rather have the best team in England and the worst pitch, or the worst team in England and the best pitch? He said, well, there's no answer to that. You better go out and play on the ground with the ball. They were denied a league and FA Cup double in a controversial Wembley final against Aston Villa. Manchester United, the favourites, and Aston Villa. United have already won the league. Can they do the double? It looks like it until in the seventh minute, Peter McParlane crashes into goalkeeper Ray Wood. Wood is carried off, and Jackie Blanchflower takes his place in goal. United never stop attacking. Tommy Taylor and Eddie Coleman are there all the time. Wood comes back on the right wing, but he's a passenger, so United concentrate on the left wing. Although Villa were now leading, United went on fighting. That only goal comes from this corner by Duncan Edwards. And that's Tommy Taylor heading it home. The progressive Busby defied the Football League's insularity with regard to English clubs competing in the European Cup by accepting United's invitation. In 1957, the team caught the public's imagination by advancing to a semi-final against the holders, the magnificent Real Madrid of Di Stefano. Manchester United are at home to Real Madrid in the second leg of the European Cup semi-final. They have a tough job in their hands, for the white-shirted Spaniards already have a two-goal lead from the first leg. So the Red Devils need a three-goal margin today for an overall victory. From the start, the crowds are treated to a sparkling display of football. Here's Madrid on the attack. Centre-forward to Stefano shoots, but goalie Wood tips it round. 
The French referee is kept busy for plays pretty rough at times. In the Madrid goal, Ismay's heads away. A neat overhead kick starts Madrid on the move, and like a flash, they're up the other end with winger Copa beating Wood for a goal. The Madrid end again. Bill Whelan tries a hook and Marquitos gives away a corner. A beautiful save by Goli Alonso. And another. The Red Devils keep up the attack, but they can't press it home. And when Madrid break out, inside left Real shows how it should be done. So Madrid are leading 2-0 at half-time, but after the interval, Manchester really start getting down to work. Left winger Peg has the ball. He centres, it bounces off Taylor, and Whelan makes sure of it. So the Red Devils have reduced the gap. But they'd need four more goals to take them on to the final, and the quick-moving, quick-thinking Spaniards make that altogether too much to hope. As the pace grows hotter, manners are forgotten by both teams, and bad tempers mar the game. Manchester score once more, but that's all they can manage. There's an ugly scene when Torres falls after colliding with left-winger Peg. Manchester try to carry him off, and Madrid to pull him back. It's a pity that such behaviour on both sides should spoil the brilliant football which gave Real Madrid their semi-final victory. I was approached to go to Real Madrid as manager, take care, take over them, and uh, Mr Bernabeu and the, the officials there said, tremendous salary, and we will make a heaven for you, Madrid. And I eventually said, to Mr. Benham, Mr. Benham, I'm very grateful for my having this here in Manchester. The following year, United reached the semi-finals again. A 3-3 draw against Red Star in Belgrade secured their place. Then disaster struck. Busby fought for his life in the Rex de Isar hospital. Well, as you're the Welsh team, the Welsh team played Israel at Cardiff in the World Cup, and uh, my assistant went, Bert, poor old Bert, and he, he had my seat and he went. The taxi from town and uh, got the office at the top end there, and Alma George, who was our secretary then. I went upstairs, and there seemed to be no one. It was more strange, there's no one around at all. And uh, I had a drink, gave her a drink. I said, jumped you heard, Jimmy? He says, I heard about what? He said, plane, the, the plane has crashed. It never struck me at all. And she said it again. Oh, I said, we'll have another drink. I'm a quick drinker, by the way, and answered my second one quickly. But uh, she said it again, and she started to cry. And then it struck me very vividly. I thought, God, no. The last thing I thought was a plane crash. So in my John little office there, I went in, I, I cried myself for 20 minutes, couldn't realise it. Heartless players you brought up, more or less live with. Very difficult. A city mourned. The world of football mourned. The potential lost was immeasurable. Tommy Taylor, David Pegg, Lenny Coleman, Mark John. Billy Whelan, Jeff Bent, oh, uh, tragic loss, tragic loss for them. In Manchester, a shaken Jimmy Murphy picked up the baton. No one realised I went through hell. Come back and I'd no one to talk to really. 
plenty of people around, but I'm talking at my 11 in soccer. And I just find a team of 11. We played Sheffield Wednesday first at Old Trafford. Sheffield team were in, obviously, in the programme, but I was, I was, when I was Manchester United, there were no names at all. Because the team, we didn't know what the team would be in, etc., etc. They locked the gate, there were 66,000 here on the ground. Billy Brooks wins the toss for Manchester United against Sheffield Wednesday. And it's the most dramatic game Busby's Babes have ever played. Wednesday and the striped shirts kick off. Less than a fortnight after the Munich air crash, the Babes are fielding a scratch side for a fifth round FA Cup tie. And apart from Brooks himself, the only member of the original team is goalie Harry Gregg. A Sheffield corner brings a moment of danger. Greg misses it, but centre-half Cope saves the day. And Greg collects it and clears. Now the United forwards are on the attack, and that was nearly it. Brennan takes the corner, and it's in. Second half, and Manchester United are still incredibly one goal up and fighting every minute of the way. Mark Pearson's shot rebounds. But Seamus Brennan's there to land a beauty. 20-year-old Brennan was only included a few hours before the match. His first big game ever, and he scored two goals. No wonder the crowd cheer themselves hoarse. And the Babes are so pleased with themselves that nothing Sheffield can do worries them now. Harry Gregg's a tower of strength to his youthful colleagues. Time and again, he turns defence into another opening for attack. 17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. The club had survived, but the man whose ideal seemed to have been destroyed found the pain almost too great to bear. I felt at the time that uh, one of the times when I did eventually come round, uh, why did I take the club into Europe? Why would you go on the plane? I remember my first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. And this was my mind in my mind. And my wife, my wife went again, come along <coughs> one of these days and said, uh, if these boys I just say that it's passed on. They would want you to carry on. Now that stayed with me for a day or two, or for some time. She quite kept labouring this. Uh, and as probably as it gradually got better, I started saying, well, perhaps she's right. Uh, and from there, I started saying, well, I'll go back, but it's going to be a terrible struggle. I got this stage, I was, actually, I was, in a way, I was, I was terrified to come and look at the ground and feel the, the people at that time. Uh, and as I say, the biggest obstacle, once I'd done it and I'd forced myself to do it, forced myself, I had to do it, uh, there was a sudden relief uh, for me. It was a very trying time. I think it said something in the nature we, we know, we're all aware of what's happened. Uh, <clears throat> we have got to carry on and rebuild this club, this great club of ours, something like that. And uh, and I got very upset and I had to go. Yeah. Murphy's scratch team of callow reserves and emergency signings careered on to the FA Cup final, where they met Bolton Wanderers. The teams line up for presentation to the Duke of Edinburgh. Matt Lofthouse presents the Wanderers, and then under the eyes of Matt Busby himself, United skipper Bill Fox presents the team which, after the Munich tragedy, very few people expected to reach the final. United kick off with the sun but against the wind. Little Ernie Taylor, Harry Gregg jumps and nearly loses it. Bolton winger Douglas Holden kicks up field. Parry heads and Gregg misses. 
Sends it for a corner. A near one. Holden takes it. It's headed out and...